free movement of people in Schengen area, common achievements in the areas of border management and internal security have become one of the most tangible symbols of European integration, a piece of Europe that every one of us can enjoy. In that sense, this conference is a symbol of the best that Europe can achieve and deliver together. Today we see a transformation of just and Home Affairs domain. That transformation leads to a very rapid convergence between internal security, border management and migration management from operational and also from policy point of view. We cannot anymore draw border lines between them. And at the same time, the ongoing digital revolution will continue and even accelerate its effects in the coming years. Therefore, EU should continue to further explore the capabilities of technologies to make border management, internal security and migration management stronger and smarter. As far as I'm concerned, I see three pillars to make that happen. First of all, promoting and supporting technology innovation. Second, developing continuously the cooperation between the EU agencies, member states and the private sector. And third, reinforcing common legal framework. Think big and dream big. Use the opportunity to share experiences and ideas between each other because this is the best way to develop the adequate responses of the challenges that we face today, but at the same time to prepare all of us for the challenges of tomorrow. It is becoming more and more difficult to rely on traditional means of border control to ensure an uninterrupted flow of travelers across the border on the one hand and the same or even better levels of security on the other. The evolution in travel needs and habits puts a great deal of pressure on our traveler processing capabilities, a situation further complicated by ongoing and emerging security threat around the European Union. We therefore have to ask ourselves a critical question. How is it possible to facilitate the journey of a growing number of travelers while simultaneously improving the detection and identification of people who may be a risk to the EU's external sec internal security or, indeed, people who could be at risk of abuse through smugglers or traffickers themselves. We speak a great deal about individual systems and databases, but for us to truly exploit the potential that new technologies have to offer, these systems have to be able to speak to each other. This is the essence of interoperability. Interoperability would also take us much closer to filling the information gaps that are currently undermining the quality of the decisions we are taking about people crossing our borders in our own interest and also their interest. Uh, if there is one area when looking at uh, the many challenges on the uh, interior affairs fronts where there is a very, very strong expectations uh, uh, in Europe uh, and this from all member states at all level. Uh, it is really to uh, professionalize and to further Europeanize our border management and uh, this is an area where you will have seen uh, over the last years quite dramatic uh, developments. Uh, dramatic developments in the sense uh, of uh, uh, codifying a number of obligations at our borders, professionalizing the way we actually do uh, manage uh, uh, the uh, border procedures uh, with systematic checks being uh, introduced everywhere, but also uh, immense uh, uh, efforts in order to pull additional resources together, pull resources at the European Union level, resources in terms of uh, uh, people, staff to be deployed at the borders, resources in terms of equipment uh, being made available to uh, border guards, but also uh, resources in terms of developing new solutions and new systems. Speaking as a responsible for uh, ICT in the Ministry of Interior of Austria, what is the impact of especially interoperability on a pure national level? It's not only a comprehensive technical implementation with massive effects on our existing national, also national systems, but it also leads to legal and organizational challenges 
and has a high impact on the border control process. For the end users we are talking about, the national workflow processes need to be very clear and very easy to understand. The end user must be able to make decisions in a short time and with a high quality. So interoperability for me is all about having the right information at the right time in the right place. And this information has to be unique, secure, reliable and trustworthy. From my point of view, for the police officer, we have to provide a very, very um, accessible um, interface with actionable and direct uh, information. And in the background, we have to work more just to fill all the gaps that we have in the different databases, in the different systems, in order to make sure that this action is taken based on solid grounds uh, of the information available we have at this time. This is not about tomorrow, it's about today. So we have to work every single day on this work. The proposal from the Commission regarding interoperability is a reality. Mr. Ronidi has stressed that we, the, the phase of discussion are over, so we have a clear, clear vision where we want to reach, where we're going to go, and we have to start discussion about the implementation of all these, um, all these systems. We need to work on realities. We need to work on delivering these, these systems in order to make sure that in two years' time only, 2021 is almost there, we have already all these systems up and running in order to make sure that the, the, the interoperability is a reality. So I feel that I, I will share as well with you that the, the, in our day by day work, we are making this happen. We will have more information. We will have more systems for a reliable, a more reliable identification security screening. And it's all about not having more data. It's about making a better decision. But there is also that aspect which uh, was mentioned earlier also. We will have a more complex environment. We will have different data from different authorities. It will force us a bit to, uh, to reinforce our consultation procedures and uh, with different agencies and member states involved. At the national level, given, given, given the, the role of the national units and how they will have to interact when they deal with information related to migration or migration databases and security databases, border management, migration and security actors will have also to work closer together. So I think it's also a, a, an excellent example on how we will push uh, cooperation at the EU level and at national level to, to a new to a new limit, to a new height. We need uh, better quality information. We need this information to be linked. We need the, the responsible authorities, if you like in legal terms, the competent authorities or the designated authorities where the law allows them to have uh, access to, to take, to have this access and take uh, proper decisions. So this is in fact leading to better decision making, better security, it's leading to more accuracy. We have now experience so we can design better the future systems, we can now analyze errors so we can bring a lot of quality, we can bring systems talking to each other if you like in plain language in better way and thus to allow all these authorities, also private stakeholders, carriers, for example, have a better view on the spot, a fast view to take the step uh, that they need to take. And I want to be short but clear. Yes, we do spend, but I see it as a European citizen and as an investment. We invest for the future. We invest for our children, we invest on security. This means also that we invest also for the third country nationals who want to visit Europe to feel more secure. So we do not invest only on security, but we invest on confidence. Confidence means growth, means 
uh, investments, means uh, stabilization, means all these things. So I see it in this way. It's an investment for our future. So several years ago, uh, Canada and the United States came to an agreement in, back in 2011 in terms of managing our integrated borders, in terms of securing our perimeter and having an integrated approach. Therefore, stemming from our 2011 uh, agreement between the two countries, we've established a few initiatives. One similar to the ETS, our electronic travel, travel authorization, which we fully launched back in 2015. And as well, we have an ongoing uh, initiative for similar to the entry exit, slightly different, but still in the same realm in terms of uh, the approach that we're taking which uh, we should be seeing launching in spring 2019. What we had in mind is to uh, mobilize the national facilitation program uh, that is provided for by EES and uh, to uh, maybe uh, have uh, all the, uh, the, the travelers uh, pre-enrolled by the, by the carriers, for instance, Eurostar, that might provide name, surname, uh, all the, the background information for the, for the people to the border guard authorities, which could actually pre-check uh, pre on, the, on the on signal and database and uh, enroll, uh, biometrically speaking, once at the, at the booth, which would uh, relieve uh, the, the border guard from a, a lot of load, which might, I think, or we think, uh, help, uh, help a bit. Uh, will that uh, bring us to a normal situation? We do not know. We have to test. I believe at least ATR's PNR and also the, the Sirene procedures need to be taken into account here. At least um, with this recast, it will be a, a bigger topic. Um, and this is obvious, but we get more and more information. This is good. That leads to more security, uh, but also to more complexity. Um, and especially in terms of first line, second line, the flagging mechanism, we also have this uh, in the PNR world that we need to take the travelers out of first line, of the first line, to the second line, more and more procedures like this. Uh, how do we organize this? Uh, how do we train the border guards? How do we design the IT applications to make this smooth? It's going to be interesting. Strong involvement of the border guards. This is, I think, uh, personally, it's the most, uh, the most critical factor that we have to deal in. Uh, they will have to, to see the system, they will have to want to work with the system. From our perspective, the most sexual uh, factors is that if the user wants to use the system and sees the added value, if the system gets in the way of their work, they will not use it and they will find all the excuses that they have not to use it. But if they see the added value, if the system is performant, is available when they need it, it's available where they need it, they, they will start use it, using it. Are we getting smarter or are we getting greedier when it comes to the information? And are we getting technology-focused, information-focused, or and when we're talking about technology then, and future technology, that is a particularly interesting subject to me, that, because I would appreciate that the, the decisions were made on, uh, based on existing technology. And here I'm not always quite sure that when someone mentions the term future technology, that are they literally referring to the future technology, which will not be there at the time of the implementation. You know, this morning when we left the hotel, the, some colleagues from Frontex with our director, uh, we were using a GPS, Google Maps application, of course, and uh, and we were very. I was very focused on on the image of the of the screen, and I tripped over, and I fell. So was I smarter because I was using one application, or, or was I clumsy because I was using an application? And that's pretty much what I think Pasi was saying, and and Pedro was highlighting. We need to be motivated. We need to be innovative, we need to think out of the box, work together, uh, but also be prepared for technology. And currently the level of preparedness is something that we need uh, to step up on. And indeed I can confirm that the agencies and Frontexes are highly committed to, to work with you hand in hand.